I'm now going to try and characterize the digital age through looking at these applications. Uh, and I'm going to focus on four characteristics. Characteristic number one is that the digital age is the age of being in between. And here's an example. This is a set of screenshots of my own cell phone from a, uh, from a few days ago. This part's working right. No, is this not? Uh, I want to point it. Here we go. Yes, perfect. So, on the left, the leftmost screen is my WhatsApp. The middle screen is my Twitter, and the right hand side is my uh, GW email account. And I have to say, I did not doctor this in any way. This is genuine, hot off the press. The only thing I did do was scroll up or down to protect the innocent. <laughs> okay, but there's nothing that's been edited out or photoshopped. So here we have on my WhatsApp, we'll start with my WhatsApp page. Let's look at the number of groups in which I participate. So we'll start with pluralism leadership, which is one of my courses here at GW. And this is where my students put up their comments and questions about the reading. So here Adrian is commenting on Eamon Callan's article on free speech on campus. Hmm. We move down one and it says, Mishpachat Eisenberg Echad, which means the Eisenberg number one family. You may be thinking, who are the Eisenberg family and why are they number one? There is no Eisenberg family and they do not have numbers. Eisenberg is the name of my street. Number one is the name of our, of our block. We live in apartment 81 in one Eisenberg street. But the people who are responsible for that group on WhatsApp like to think of themselves as a family. And therefore, it's really the homeowners association of Eisenberg number one. <laughs> but it calls itself the Eisenberg number one family which is a very kind of, there's a lot of Israel in that little description. Uh, this actually leads off into a lot of misunderstandings with people uploading their holiday snaps and they're soon told to take them down. So, uh, but it's kind of this community, uh, which is like this vertical neighborhood. I moved down. Michelle Elciani is a colleague of mine at my former place of work who was writing in to tell me about something that happened that day to share with me the fact that the third cohort of the program that we launched has gone off the ground. And then, Bubba's faves. Bubba's faves. That's my fave. Bubba is my mother. Mm -hmm. And she is the mother and grandmother to a wonderful family. And she decided that she was going to have a, a, a WhatsApp group in which she would communicate with her favorite people in the world. Who are her favorite people in the world? Her <laughs> children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So Bubba's faves is the children and grandchildren. It's mainly used for wishing people luck before a new job sending happy birthdays, happy anniversary, organizing some family events. And I could go on. What you can see from just the format is that in any given moment, I will be moving at the flick of a thumb between multiple communities. I don't even have to leave the room. I don't have to wait instantaneously. I move between communities. The language of communication will change. The points of reference will change. The things we have in common will change at the move of a thumb. At a slightly larger move of a thumb, this way, as opposed to that way, I go to Twitter. And what you'll notice here is, first of all, there's a very strange one in the middle, which is the Liverpool Football Supporters Club of Indonesia. <laughs> I'll say about something about that in a moment. At the bottom, you'll, you'll notice a, a message from Dr. Brown, who teaches here at GW, where she pretty much every day uploads uh, some kind of quotation from the Talmud. And I always like seeing what she's put up. But this one on Liverpool, what's that about? Well, uh, not so long ago, I was giving a lecture about um, identity in the digital age. And I was started thinking about um, the ways in which people support football clubs when they're never going to go and visit them. They have no connection with the locality, uh, but they're very fervid supporters. And I thought, huh. I'm going to go on Twitter and see what supporters clubs are. Somehow I came to the Indonesian Liverpool Supporters Club. And the thing that interested me was how many followers they had. Turns out that they have 178 followers. Now Anfield, the football ground in Liverpool, which takes all its fans, has only room for 54,000. That means that just the Indonesian supporters of Liverpool Football Club could fill it three times. They will never visit Liverpool, chances are. I don't know what their connection is with Liverpool. But they, like me, consider themselves part of a community that supports Liverpool Football Club. 
This is something that never used to exist. And it is made possible by the internet. And then finally we get to my internet. This is one of about 10 accounts. And this particular one I use for work. So you'll have stuff from students. There's something from payroll. Oh, I probably should open that. Anyway, you have a bunch of things going on, all within thumb distance. And within a matter of seconds, you can move between these different communities, these different ways of being, and define yourself in different ways. So we are spending our lives in between. <laughs> the next aspect of the internet age that I want to bring up is the fact that it's always on. There is no escape from it. It's everywhere you go. And even when you think you're doing something else, generally, you're on it. And as we were discussing this week in class, the way I put it was, it's not a technological tool that we use. It's become more like an artificial limb. Instead of being organic beings, we are becoming bionic beings, in which this thing that we are holding most of the day in our hands is a part of our body, almost. It's affecting our sleep, it's affecting our relationships, because it's always there. Even when it's turned off, we know it's there, and there's the potential to just take it out of the bag and take a journey into another world within seconds. Another characteristic is that the internet has, had, has us spending more time alone than we have ever spent before. This is from Gene Twenge's book on uh, iGen, which is the, which is the generation it's called Generation Z by others, which is the generation that grew up in the age of smart smartphones. They became uh, adolescents in the age of smartphones. And this, these data here in this graph show this line is the decline. This is the number of, of uh, 12th graders who spend uh, an average of, who have an average of uh, four meetings in person with their peers a week. Just think about it. That's just four times getting together to go to the mall, sitting and watching TV together. This is face-to-face -face interactions with their peers. So this is four, it's not a large number, and it's in serious decline between 2006 and 2015. And what's going up and has crossed over? The percentage of 12th graders who spend 10 or more hours per week on their cell phones. Now this was only in 19, uh, this is in uh, 2015. Everybody's internet use has increased massively since then. And so the new pictures will look even more dramatic. But you might say, hang on a second, they're not spending time alone, they're with people, but virtually. What about Facebook? My kids have more friends than I've ever had. They have hundreds of friends. <laughs> and then there are those who immediately say, hang on a second, friends on Facebook aren't real friends. How can you really have so many friends? You can't have so many friends. Well, it turns out that the average user on Facebook this is teen users, has around 145 friends. <laughs> but these friends are not friends as we know them, because there are things we can do to those friends that we couldn't do so easily before. We can unfriend them. We can ghost them. We can, what was the word I learned this week? We can cancel them. <laughs> that thank you students. Yeah, we can cancel them. Uh, and there are things that we can do that are very dramatic, brutal, and immediate. So something has changed about the relationship. However, experts on friendship, and you may recognize the name, Dunbar is famous because of Malcolm Gladwell. He was doing some really interesting work before Malcolm Gladwell came along and cited him. He's an expert on friendship and friendship relations. He's been doing his research for decades in Oxford University. But Malcolm Gladwell cited him in the tipping point for the Dunbar number. The Dunbar number of 150 is the approximate number of a, the, the size of a village, the size of a small kinship group, and it's the recommended size for a functional organization. Any organization that grows bigger than that, as Malcolm Gladwell wrote in The Tipping Point about Gore-Tex, they had the wisdom to split themselves up into units no bigger than 150, and that's why they're so successful. Um, this is a kind of a constant almost in, in human relations. Dunbar, in 2018, was asked by Trends in Cognitive Science to write an article summarizing all of the research on friendship in the time of the internet. And they asked him the basic question, has it changed? Is something bad happening? 
And if so, what can we do about it? And the answer of Dunbar was, nothing has changed. When we look at those relationships, there are intimate circles of friends, there are slightly larger circles of friends. The same is true on, on Facebook as it is in real life. Uh, nothing much has changed. He did make a small proviso, which we can discuss maybe in the Q&A, saying, yet. Saying, nothing has changed yet. We relate to our friends on Facebook in a very similar way to how we relate to our friends. One of the things that has changed is that these outside groups have grown. And so what we used to call vague acquaintances and didn't pay much attention to, we now pay a certain kind of attention to. But at that core of 150 down, nothing much has changed according to Dunbar. However, something has changed which is that friendship has never been quite so competitive. Maybe it's better to describe these as frenemies, <laughs> some of them, than friends. The fact that people constantly require likes, or as another phrase that I read this week by, uh, in a book by Sula, who's, uh, John Sula, who's writing about this in uh, Ireland, um, he published a book in 2016 on psychology in the digital age, and what he calls the, cyber black, the black hole of cyberspace. The fear that you'll send out a message and no one will notice. That you won't be liked. You won't be replied to. And as we learn from a number of studies, teenagers are under, feel under enormous pressure, enormous stress, in having to keep up and do things that will be likable and to also like the things that their friends put up. It's like the, what it means to not like something that a friend of yours has put up is quite dramatic. So there's an enormous amount of pressure that is now put on these relationships that may be changing friendship for good. And finally, the internet age is an age of disconnection. It's ironic, isn't it? This is the most connected and networked age. And as one set of researchers called it, we are networked but disconnected. If you look at any of the data that talk about any kind of pro-social connection. Uh, the kinds of things that Robert Putnam wrote about in 1995 in Bowling Alone that were in decline in America already in the late 90s. Belonging to associations, affiliating with a religion, uh, being part of the PTA session, being politically active, um, voting, but, you know, all of those things that are pro-social, they were all in decline already. And what we're seeing, though, among young people who grew up in the age of the internet, that sure enough, they're following the Putnam line in gradual decline, and then something dramatic happens. They go into dramatic freefall. These data are about the percentage affiliating with any religion. Okay, so religion is actually usually a good measure of many, many other things. And this is just one example that I brought. People are not affiliating with religion, it's just gone dramatically, dramatically down. And you can see the point of where it goes down is about the point at which smartphones where over 50% of the 50 of teens had a smartphone. So something very dramatic is happening to all those forms of affiliation. That's one way in which we're becoming disconnected. That's, what, that's the kind of social capital, the kind of connection that Robert Putnam called back then, bonding. It's what keeps people of a similar group together. He also spoke about another kind of connection, what he called bridging. Relations between people of different demographic positions. And one of the things that we are seeing now in very extreme ways is political polarization. This plot shows um, the distance between retweets of news sources according to whether they're liberal or conservative. And as you can see, there's almost no contact out there in the blogosphere or in Twitter, in Twitter world uh, between left and right. So not only are we not uh, sticking together with our own kind, we are also drifting further apart from people we consider to be unlike us. 